it's a go. Thanks, Jim. Well, welcome, guys, and uh, thank you for the in the room. Um, thank you for braving the elements to be there. And if you're if you're <coughs> joining us from uh, home, uh, welcome as well. Um, let me open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll just get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Um, even on a cold day like this, we know that you are uh, in charge of your universe and that you take care of us. And we'd ask that you bless us now as we have this conversation about suicide, which is a very challenging one to have. And um, we'd ask that you just guide us and bless us in our conversation together. We thank you for each person here. We ask all this in the name of your son. Amen. All right. So I'm going to turn in a minute, I'm going to turn this over to Jess and Ty Williams, who you can see in, in, on the on the uh, the screen, the Zoom screen there, um, and they'll explain a little bit more about what we're what we're going to talk about specifically today, which is suicide. But I just wanted to set the stage just with a couple of thoughts. The first is just to remind us sort of where we are in our series. This is week five of seven, and the first couple of weeks we just set the foundation for how do we come together as believers together in a body of church here. Uh, the body of Christ, and how do we live in community well? How do we um, live with each in, in each other's lives and, and take care of each other, even around the hard parts, the parts that are often a struggle for us? And so we talked about how do we create brave space, spaces where it's okay to not be okay, where it's okay to say, I'm not well and I need some help, and where it's okay to say, hey, I'm worried about you. Um, can, can we talk? And so that was our first two weeks. And then last week, Dave uh, Eckert came from Access and in the Intersect program. And he talked about the lens, the biblical lens. What does the Bible say? How do we approach um, mental illness through the lens of the scripture? And, and he unpacked that for us a little bit. And then today and, and the rest of the, the, the series is, is really about practical topics. What are, the, what are the actual practical realities and the hardships that, that people face and the, and the struggles that come with that? And how do we talk really, really uh, well about those things? And how do we enter into those things together? And, and we've, we've laid out this mantra for this part of, of the series, which is how do we move towards it? How do we sit with it? And how do we get help when we need to? So today's topic is going to be about suicide. So I, I want to add just one other personal thing about this as, as we get into this topic. So hopefully uh, we had talked about the gift of going second. Uh, so I'm going to put this out there and, and folks can, so, so we can just know that this is an okay conversation to have. I talked a couple of weeks ago about my experience with depression and the, the week that the first week that I went to a therapist, I went to get help. Um, he, he asked me about what was going on and I explained it to him and he said, it sounds like you might be really depressed and I'd like to ask you a serious, do an assessment of, of how significant your depression is. Is that okay? And so he did something called the, the Beck depression rating scale, which is a standard sort of assessment tool that you use when somebody presents with depression kinds of symptoms. And, and um, it was a, it was a, he did very well. It was conversational. It was, it was comfortable. Um, I had done this scale actually with other people. And so there was this moment, this personal moment where I realized I was on the other side of the assessment. And so there was this experience of, of relating to somebody else, what's going on inside of you in, in that moment where you've asked for help. Um, I, I tested pretty high on that depression scale. And so he said at the end of it, and he, he told me that, and he said, you seem pretty depressed. And so because you, of your, your, your score, your rating on this scale, I need to ask you some, some uh, questions about suicide. And so he did. And I, I had not been thinking about suicide and it hadn't occurred to me. Um, but all of a sudden, I, it was all so dawning on me that now there was a person who was looking at me and felt the need to do some risk assessment to make sure I was okay. So it was just a very startling moment a little bit um, for me to think about myself in, in that light. Um, and the, the thing that also struck me was the conversation shifted. When we talked about depression, he was very comfortable and it was very conversational. When we got to talk about suicide, it got, it got a little bit uncomfortable and we didn't make as good eye contact with each other. And, the, and his words didn't come quite as smoothly. It was fine. And I'm not, I'm not diminishing in any way his expertise as a therapist. He's a really good therapist. I'm simply acknowledging that humanly, this is suicide is a really, really hard thing to talk about. And it's really important that we figure out how to move bravely into it. Monday night, last Monday night, 
Ty and, and Jess and Mara and I were at um, Ursinus College to sit with a community there in their grief after having lost a professor a week and a half ago to suicide. And when I sit in that conversation with those people in that grief, and it, that happens from time to time, it, it impresses on me every single time. I walk away every single time with a sense of urgency for this part of the conversation, because it's hard no matter how you talk about it, when you have to talk about it, but it's really vital that we talk about the reality of this and how it impacts all of us in community. So that's what we're hoping to do. We're gonna move into this, this conversation bravely. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn that over to Jess and Ty. All right, thanks, Mark. Good morning, everybody. We're good again for the opportunity to gather around an important topic. Um, this is a topic that Ty and I actually look forward to talking about, which I think some people find odd or interesting, but it, um, you know, Mark just highlighted it's an important one. Um, sometimes the topic suicide can feel really intimidating, perhaps overwhelming, um, you know, just as we even get started. Just want to remind ourselves, this is really just another hard conversation. And it's um, in the context of community, and certainly in the context of our faith community, we are um, very frequently invited into hard conversations with one another. So this is uh, a conversation with someone on, on some of their hardest spaces or hardest days is an easier way sometimes to reframe that. So I wanna um, introduce Ty Williams. Ty works at Access. He's our community trainer and liaison attached to the mobile crisis program and he oversees our Hope for Tomorrow program. Um, at Access, we do a lot of work around suicide education prevention, and unfortunately, as Mark mentioned, postvention, which is coming in to support individuals, families, and communities after loss to suicide. Um, it is a it's a gift to be able to enter sacred spaces with people, both um, as they're considering suicide and after after we've lost someone after suicide. We do this work as a part of our larger mobile crisis services and also um, certainly in our other programs where we serve individuals who struggle, it's important to have a great deal of fluency around how to feel comfortable to have conversations with people who are struggling because thoughts about not wanting to live anymore are really common in, in the spaces when, when we struggle. Um, I'll turn this over to Ty and let him talk a little bit more about um, his work. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ty Williams, as uh, Jess and Mark mentioned. Um, and Hope for Tomorrow is an extension of, of the conversation, if you will. So I, I spend a lot of times in the community, namely schools, talking to students about how to engage around issues related to suicide. Our Hope for Tomorrow program is really cool and unique in that uh, I'm in a room with students and we're asking some really hard questions questions that are specific to uh, whether students feel uh, depressed or anxious, whether they've had thoughts of suicide recently. And uh, one of the things that we do to make it really interactive is we, we have a screen that we place uh, in the room so the students can answer those questions in real time. And so they are literally seeing their responses to some of the questions around mental health and suicide as I'm asking them. And one of the overwhelming things about uh, you know, the Hope for Tomorrow presentation and program is that most all students say that they, they struggle with two things. One, all, all students or the majority of the students that uh, we support through the Hope for Tomorrow program all say that they feel more comfortable speaking to others about physical issues than they do mental health concerns or issues that they have within themselves. That's something that really sticks out. Number two, most of the students that we support through the Hope for Tomorrow program, they share that they have at one point in time or another in their lives, lives had thoughts of suicide. So, so we consider those two things. We, uh, and I say we, myself, um, I'm included. You know, we, we are very much more comfortable talking to people about things that happen to us physically when we are, uh, when we are just not feeling our best emotionally. So, so that's something uh, that we really, really take time to dive into through the Hope for Tomorrow program. <coughs> I, um, I also support uh, 
schools through a training called QPR, which is a suicide prevention training, where we talk specifically about how you might support someone who is having um, thoughts or, uh, or having a, a desire to kill themselves. It's a very uh, specific type of training. It's evidence-based. Uh, and we talk about three steps that an individual might take. And so so um, that you know, being said, we are really excited to be here to extend this conversation uh, with, with you. And yeah, so morning, looking forward to my time with you. Thanks, Ty. <clears throat> I'm gonna share a PowerPoint, um, but I might leave it frequently because this is a this topic is a really is one for conversation. I think the best information we usually get when we have these conversations come through questions and comments together. So I, I want to empower everyone to feel comfortable to interrupt, um, to ask a question, or maybe if you're um, in the room with your arms and maybe make a lot of big scene, we might we might see it or just yell. Um, Mark already gave us an introduction, so I wanna speed through this. The point of this is really just sort of organizing, providing some information. Ty mentioned that in the Hope for Tomorrow presentation, he gives students an anonymous opportunity to share their own experience around um, symptoms of, of mental illness or unwellness, and also about suicide. And it has been overwhelming to see between 60 and 70% of high school students across different parts of Montgomery County report that at some time in high school, they've thought about suicide before, which suggests that it's more normal when you're in high school to think about not wanting to live anymore than it is not to have those thoughts. In fact, um, when we look at the data, I think that we notice most people have thought to themselves at some point, I just don't wanna live like this anymore. In fact, I would argue everyone has, and for the most part, we're fortunate that we can make decisions that make us less uncomfortable. We can pivot away from scenarios um, that are hurting us and move into places where we're less um, in pain so that we don't have feelings like we don't wanna to continue to live like this anymore. But some people don't have those opportunities. Um, when we look at the data, I just put some data up here. It's not very comprehensive. It's just a couple important pieces to to just provide the scope of the issue. The point here is to say, it's pretty normal to think about suicide as a human being, that when we're overwhelmed by difficult circumstances, it's really normal to think, I don't wanna, I don't wanna live. I wish I didn't have to wake up again tomorrow morning. And there's about 4% of the adult population thinking that right now. So when we look at how many people are in our congregation this morning, four out of a hundred people, and that's a really low number because how do we get that data self-report? There's um, at least a handful of calls that come across the mobile crisis hotline in Montgomery County every week where someone says, I attempted suicide, it didn't work, I'm making this phone call. Those are largely unreported attempts and individuals that had the opportunity to try again. That isn't accurately captured in data. So any data that we see around suicide is is really largely underreported. I do wanna point out this statistic that over half of the people who die by suicide are not connected to mental health services. You can look at that in one of two ways. One is, are there enough mental health services to go around for everyone? Um, that's uh, largely a, a pretty significant question right now in 2022, as we're all sort of moving towards some recovery around the uh, global pandemic. Um, but I think our experience suggests that the individuals who die by suicide haven't had a history of connection to the mental health system. Perhaps it would have been helpful, but what it tells us is we're not talking about people who live with serious mental illness as, as the primary target population. Our experience, in fact, when we go into postvention opportunities is these are not individuals that we've known who've struggled over time um, with mental illness. I think the people that we know who struggle over time with mental illness work really hard on their wellness. They have a lot of opportunity for support, resource, connection. I think the people who perhaps die with greater regularity in our experience are people who don't have connection where they feel safe and comfortable to say, I'm struggling, 
I'm struggling so much that I'm thinking about taking my life. But let's, I just want to open up this conversation a little bit together where we can ask, why is suicide so difficult to talk about? And, and you can also hop in there if you want and talk about maybe why, you know, the, the church angle, why is it especially hard sometimes to talk about in churches? Well, why is this such a difficult conversation? Well, I think there's still a very, very strong stigma against uh, the concept of mental illness that, you know, you can have cancer and still be accepted, but you're depressed or something. Uh, oh, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, there is something wrong with you. And I need help. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. The point about suicide being difficult for us church people, I think, is that we feel, well, we shouldn't have those kind of thoughts, um, that we're, we're, we're being unfaithful to our faith and to God and to Jesus. If we consider uh, wasting uh, the, the life that he's given to us in a, in a suicide. So we have the existing stigma around even talking about not being well, but even an additional layer as a Christian around talking about being well and maybe you shouldn't be unwell, which I think, you know, happily Dave was able to dispel some of those myths for us last week. That's a great point. What else makes suicide a hard conversation? I don't have a pill for that. Hmm. I don't have a cure. I can't, you, you'd come up to me in the hall and say, I wanna kill myself. Where do I go with that? And how can I fix that for you? That's a, typical of these men, we like to fix stuff. <laughs> I think we all do. That's actually, um, if this was like family feud, Jonathan, that would come up as like the top five um, answers. That when we have this conversation frequently, someone always says, what if I don't know how to fix it? And I think the answer to that is you won't know how to fix it. In fact, um, most individuals who are struggling with thoughts of suicide is because they haven't figured out how to fix it. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of parts we can talk about in, in that space about how when when we're less well, we have um, less access to all of our creative problem solving capacity. We're not as innovative when we're not in good places. Um, that's why, you know, one of the gazillion reasons why it's so important to surround ourselves with community, with circles of people that we trust who are resourceful when we're struggling, when we're not doing well, why um, connections to others being existing in a community is a protective factor. But certainly in that space, if there were easy solutions or fixes, uh, the person probably wouldn't be in that space of struggle. Um, I wonder if we have thoughts or ideas about what is helpful then in that space. If what is the value of community if it's not to fix it? I'll go ahead and holler out. Um, I, just a, a thought that I have just uh, on your first question, why is it hard to talk about? It seems that it, it's, I don't, myself i don't particularly find it that difficult to talk about but that other people do it seems that there must be a lack of trust or fear of being vulnerable um which is um which is a shame that we could all be together in church in a building and yet still feel very very isolated um Somehow there, there's a there's a disconnect. If if we're all getting together in Christ's name to worship Christ, and yet we're still some disconnected, that something's broken. We need we need to work on connecting, because there should be trust, and and there should be um, we should we should figure out a way to um, allow ourselves to be vulnerable with each other. Um, but I think there's a fear there and there's a lack of trust. Yeah, I think you're right, Dan. 
I think it's so difficult to be vulnerable. And some of the reasons we've already mentioned this morning, that idea of stigma, that it's uncomfortable for me to say that I'm struggling, maybe I'm depressed or um, I'm struggling with wellness. And, and maybe that's hard to say out loud. Sometimes it's associated with behaviors like addiction, which are also really hard to talk about. And there so much shame is attached to that. Vulnerability comes with a risk. And sometimes when we measure that risk, it doesn't feel safe for us to do that. And, and yet we say like we're, we are targeting that, that kind of community where we're able to have those important conversations with one another. Um, and it does require that risk. It requires that I'm willing to do that. When Mark spoke in, um, in the larger space a couple weeks ago about addiction, he talked about giving the gift of going second, which was something we've all borrowed from Dave Eckert, who you heard from last week. That reality that when we vulnerably share first, we give permission for someone else to say, hey, me too, and to perhaps elaborate further on that. So I think that um, that idea of vulnerable communities is a really good and important one. And in churches, there's so many additional layers of, um, of opportunity to inappropriately attach ourselves to shame around some of those behaviors. The, um, what Dave described last week as a really um, inaccurate belief that the Bible or God has called us to something impossible. Um, you know, we talked about Philippians last week, that it's, we're both human and called um, by God to rejoice. How do we do both? How can we be um, realistic and real in our spaces of struggle while at the same time um, aspiring to please God and how, and how we can handle that? A lot of good stuff there, but um, I'm gonna move in here and give Ty this section. Oh, Ty, we can't hear you. We lost you there. Am I good? Am I okay? Yep. There you are. Yep. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So I think I think that uh, we bring up some really really good points uh, when we speak specifically about shame. Lost you. Lost the audio. We lost. Kind of going time. in and out there. I'm not. I don't know what's. You oh. you're good now. Am yeah. I good now. Yeah. There you are. You're good. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um. So there were some really, really good points made with regard to this, this church space, if you will. Most of us who are believers in Christ, we want to live our lives in a way that pleases God. And, and for me, I can speak uh, to the, the fact that when I'm in a church space, sometimes it's hard for me to be honest and open because if I share a struggle, uh, an addiction, that uh, is associated with depression, then, then really what I'm doing is I'm talking a little bit about sin or maybe some sin that I might be experiencing. And, and that's hard for, for us to talk to each other about, but we know that the Bible does talk a little bit about what we should do. In fact, you know, it's past where most of you are familiar with where God says that we should confess our sins one to another. But the Bible also gives really, really cool examples of individuals who we love and admire, but they had struggle. Here's an example. Um, in 1 Kings, uh, the prophet Elijah, he says to God that he'd rather die. You know, my life is not worth living. And this happens when Elijah is just coming out of a very, very strong victory for God. But what we, what we see with Elijah is that even he, in having access, relationship with God, being able to communicate with God, uh, he still struggles with wanting to live. And so what that says to us is that, you know, even when we are our best selves, if you will, spiritually, there's still struggle. There's still the thought uh, of, of not being good enough. There's still, if we're to be honest, spaces where in our own time and our deepest, darkest hours, where we, we have that one sin or two that leads to depression and other areas. But we'll, we'll talk a little more about um, the practicality of this as we, as we move forward. One of the metaphors that we <clears throat> use often in these conversations is is one of a backpack. And that is that each one of us wakes up in the morning and um, 
straps on an invisible backpack that we carry. And in that backpack is um, really the, the burdens or the crosses that we, that we carry that come as a part of our lives. They may be things that are experiences we've had in the past that we stay, stay with us or grief that, is, that will always stay with us. Um, maybe it is things that are more current um, current conflicts or issues, things that we're struggling sort of in, in the right now. And, and certainly the hard and heavy things that we carry that make up our lives. Individuals who have a medical diagnosis that may be chronic is a weight in the backpack that we'll always carry. Um, if you're a parent of a child with special needs, or perhaps you're a care caregiver for an aging parent or another family or loved one, those are weights in your backpack just the things that we carry that are, <clears throat> excuse me, part of being us. So this is one way that we've helped people sort of better understand the idea of how does a mental illness connect to the concept of suicide? How does um, sort of the hard things of a medical diagnosis, aging, um, so many things that are difficult in our lives, how does that connect to suicide? And I think this is one of the easiest ways for us to sort of have that concept is that we're all carrying hard things. And that those hard things often take from us our coping capacity, our management strategies. And when there are new and sudden weights added to that backpack is when people will, as human, just humans, will have the most risk. And you can think back in your own life and think of some of those examples. A time when maybe there was a new diagnosis, um, a sudden um, notification that something horrible has happened that will change your, your life or experiences new weight added to the backpack. So what we're functionally looking for are people who are tipping over backwards from the weight of their backpack. What do we do to support people who are suffering and struggling under the weight of that backpack? And what do you do when you're a person who's carrying a very heavy backpack? Um, we, we often say there's kind of three things that you do. One, um, you, you get help. People surround you and they help you carry that for a period of time until two, you get stronger to carry the weight. And three, sometimes we have good and intentional conversations about how might you lighten some of the weight in that backpack. I, I always give the example, we have a coworker who lost multiple family members, his immediate family members to suicide. And he himself was, um, was a crisis worker for a lot of years. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack in that conversation, um, a lot about how you know, some, we don't have control over the decisions of other people about how, you know, where I stop and, and you start and you can't, we can't make people make certain decisions. That's certainly a good part of the conversation. But when Jeff lost his, his brother to suicide, we had an intentional conversation about what are some of the weights in his backpack that he could remove on call from work, et cetera. What are the things that we can take out that give him a little bit more muscle for carrying the new weight that had just been added to his, to his back? Getting stronger over time, I was recently listening to a, a podcast where Jerry Sitzer was talking, and he is a theologian who lost his wife, mother, and child instantly in a car accident in the 90s and has written some books about suffering and about grief and loss. And he said that it never goes away. It's not something that will ever go away. You just grow some more muscle around it, around how to deal and manage, manage it. Um, if you've had ever an opportunity to read his book, um, I, I recommend it. I think it's um, helpful just even for the sake of having some empathy and understanding um, some of the journey of other people who've had some significant loss. But that speaks to the reality that the backpack, sometimes it's not ever going to get lighter. Um, we know people and we sit with people who, who struggle and suffer, and that's not going to change. But we can build those spiritual muscles around how, how, we, how we carry that, that load. So kind of moving it to sit with it. So move toward it. So, you know, hopefully this conversation is, is helping us understand suicide is an important topic to talk about. That really we're talking about having a conversation with someone on probably one of their hardest days or in one of the hardest spaces and being with. And we've talked about the value of community is with. So how do we do that? How do we sit with it? How do we live in community around the topic of I'm, I'm so suffering or so struggling that I'm not sure I want to continue to live? So um, 
The first point here is people who have the opportunity to talk about suicide are safer. There, it reduces risk if we have the opportunity to talk about how we're doing. And that's something that we often see taken from people largely because of our own discomfort. So um, we see this all the time in the mental health system where an individual reveals that they're struggling with thoughts of suicide and they're um, sort of forced into a treatment regime that they didn't choose or um, a loss of opportunity to make their own decisions. And that's one reason, at least in our mental health community, where people don't always feel safe to talk about suicide. In fact, they learn over time not to talk about it or they'll dance up close to that line, but not be able to fully embrace. And I think the, the research, the latest research suggests that when we give people space and opportunity to talk about it and still own their decisions as much as possible, they have the best outcomes. Being with is a community concept. It is, um, Jonathan said, when I'm walking down the hall and someone says, I wanna kill myself, I don't have a pill for that. Or what if I can't fix it? And I said, well, what do you, I wonder what people need in the sense of community. And I would argue that just being with, sitting with, um, truly listening to understand, hearing, being present, takes the aloneness out of what can be an overwhelming experience. When we know all the cards are stacked for someone not to talk about their struggle with suicide, it makes it very alone and increasingly risky. When we know people can talk about it and they've surrounded themselves with a, a group of people that have the, um, the bravery to sit and listen, so still walk next to you in those spaces that it can be pretty transformative. And then lastly, asking directly about suicide, not being afraid to say, hey, I was just in this conversation and I heard that it's really important when, when we're really struggling to ask the people that we love and care about if they're thinking about suicide, I wanna ask you about that. When I go and spend time sitting in the mobile crisis space and listen to crisis workers taking calls, um, it's very, very normal and um, necessary on those calls to ask a person if they're thinking about suicide. And everyone sort of has their own style of doing that. And I think one of the things that I found to be most effective is when I hear a crisis worker say, hey, when I, every time I hear someone tell me so, you have so much burden and there's so much in your backpack or there's so much on your plate. And it's so normal when someone has so much on their plate for them to think about suicide. Has that happened for you yet? Normalizing. This is, this is really normal as a human being when you're overwhelmed to think about not wanting to live anymore. Has that happened to you yet? And, and maybe it hasn't, but now I'm a safe person for you to come to. Um, if those thoughts do, do come for you. Um, I'm gonna push this question off to the end a little bit because we're, we're just kind of moving through our time. But I, I just wanna challenge you to think about this. When people have truly sat with you in your hardest, darkest spaces, what, what, what about support was helpful? I think also important to ask ourselves, what about help hasn't been helpful before? Um, what made it easier for you to be open and to share and and what maybe made it less easy? Because that helps us sort of target the kind of support that we want to offer to other people. And so, so God gives us a prescriptive as, as to how we could help and support others. These, these scriptures really boil down to three things. You know, James, um, he encourages the believers to confess their sins one to another. What happens when we do that? It creates authenticity. It creates space for us to, to share, as we've been talking about this morning, about the hard things that are going on in our lives. And, and with that, if we are doing those things in an effective way, we are really destigmatizing all of the things that surround struggles with mental health. Because we're being honest and transparent with one another about what we're experiencing. And then the beautiful thing about uh, the church community is that we have a God that we can pray to, to ask for forgiveness. And we have a God that we can pray to on behalf of others to support them when they are in those hard spaces as well. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is encouraged by the comfort that Titus gave to the Corinthian church after some really hard things happened there. And Paul speaks specifically about how he uh, longed for the church to be healed of some things that it was struggling with. 
and that Titus's comfort to the church was a big part of what moved that church past what they were struggling with. And so, and so we see that one, confessing our sins opens up the door for us to be transparent, have hard conversations. We then know uh, that, that as we have these hard conversations, being there to comfort each other is, is really important. And then how we do that makes a difference as well. This is, is, is just as mentioned in being in the, these, these spaces where we can have real conversations and ask direct questions. We wanna consider really what is the best way to get the outcomes that we might desire? Namely, an individual has said to me, hey, I'm, or I'm noticing some things about an individual's experience and I, and I wanna have a real genuine conversation with them. And I want them to feel as if they're supported in us and having and us having and us having a conversation with one another. How do I do that in a way that lets the person know that I'm genuine? Well, in Ephesians, in Ephesians you, know, you know, the Apostle Paul he he teaches us that right that we are to be humble and gentle, patient, and accepting one another in love. So. If we are doing all of these things, then it really creates that space for us to, to begin to, to sit with the things that, uh, that are really uncomfortable about having this conversation. So then the last section is getting help when you need it. So move toward it, sit with it, get help when you need it. How do you know when you need it? Um, Suicide, another metaphor that we often use to just sort of help get some practical clarity around the topic is the idea of the suicide exists on a continuum. So if we were to look at, um, for example, the hallway outside, outside this room, it extends um, you know, the length of um, the church. If one end of that hallway we could call sort of the lower risk end of the continuum. And the other end of the hallway, we might say is the area of greatest risk. There's so many people that exist on that continuum of space. And I would argue all the way at the far end, the, le the lesser risk end is a place where most humans visit. We've all sort of stepped foot there and said, this is very uncomfortable. I'm going to pivot and make it a turn away. What happens for people who land in that lower risk end? You said, I don't, I don't want to live like this anymore but they can't make those changes that help them pivot off. Perhaps they're um, children, teenagers, living in homes that are, that are very difficult or un untenable for them, um, unable to escape discomfort, maybe in situations that are abusive. Perhaps they're individuals that don't have the financial or resource opportunities to make the changes that are necessary to remove themselves from difficult circumstances. Perhaps they're people who are suffering um, under loads that we maybe don't know, can't see, understand, or maybe we do, but haven't been able to find solutions to reduce that discomfort. And they move down that continuum of risk to a place of, of greatest risk. Down at the far end of that continuum where we would say, these are the individuals that most, most at risk. People who said, I, I am going to kill myself, I know how, and I have the, um, the resource necessary to do that. Those are the individuals that we want to get in front of and we want to support very quickly and to help. But then also along that continuum are individuals who um, maybe haven't made a firm decision that they're going to move forward, but they think about wanting to die. So how we match our care for people matters um, on where they are in that continuum. It's sort of predicated or depends on where a person is in that sort of continuum of risk. We don't want to use a hammer um, on, every, on every nail. Sometimes an individual is struggling and needs more community. Um, maybe we can build some of those protective factors. When we talk about protective factors, the things that help us manage difficult circumstances or survive hard moments, hard spaces, the people that matter the most to us who surround us, with whom we're able to be very honest and very open about our struggles, who we might go to first to say, I'm not doing great, I'm not doing okay. The activities that support us to, that we can find pleasurable, our spiritual faith and connection, um, our capacity to understand God's presence with us in those hardest moments is a protective factor. So what are the protective factors for individuals, for families, and for communities? This conversation itself, 
is a protective factor, the opportunity to realize that we all have a role to play, a part to play in walking through hard spaces together. Um, there's always support available. I'd, I'm not gonna make this a commercial for um, mental health support, but I did put that mobile crisis square in the bottom because it's all right to do. But I also, um, I work at Access, I oversee these things, but I found that by Googling. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. This is, you know, you can find support. You Google Montgomery County mobile crisis, but every county pretty much has a mobile crisis support program. So you can Google that wherever you are. There's the National Suicide um, Hotline, which is another opportunity no matter where you are in the country to help and support. So there's always support available right now. But what I like to say, especially here in Montgomery County, where I have some influence over what help can look like immediately is that you're never alone to be in these conversations. So when you bravely enter a space and ask somebody to share the contents of their backpack with you and you begin to feel sort of uncomfortable, like maybe they're not doing okay and you ask directly if they've thought about suicide and they say, yes, I have, that you always have someone who has your back and, and how to respond when, it, when we realize, I think we need some help. But I think the best help, and I, I say this as a crisis provider, I think the best help is our presence with people, is our bravery to visit that space. And we listened to that Brené Brown um, video, or I think you, you did. And if you haven't, I, I would challenge you to do that. Just Brené Brown empathy, it'll come up, it's two and a half minutes. And one of the things that she talks about in that is at the very end, she's, wow, I don't even know what to say. I'm just really glad you told me. And that bravery to sit with a person in a hard moment and say, I don't even know what to say, but I'm going to be here, and I'm, I'm here, and, and I'm going to walk with you in that. Yeah, and I think um, that really what it boils down to for us as the leaders is one leaning on. Can't hear you. Yeah, you'll, yeah, there you go. All right, can you hear me? Yep, there you are. Better. Okay, sorry. Uh, so what? What? this really means for us as believers, we have access to protective factors of think where we sit now as a uh, in fellowship as believers is, is one of those protective factors. In God, uh, in Hebrews, he, he actually encourages for us to be in fellowship with each other, to have conversations like this, which serves as a way of us being able to know that we're not alone in the struggles that we have. And then then obviously God himself wants to be that. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir when I say that Jesus for all for, for all of us really provides the, the surest sense of, of comfort and peace uh, when we are in a tough space, right? And, and he provides uh, for us an outline, if you will, through his word, and, and obviously here in Matthew 11, he, he encourages us to, to come to him when we are burdened and heavy laden. And he says that he'll give us rest. So, so as we identify uh, perfect, pro protective factors outside of the church, really encouraging for us to know that God has that for us in the community that we, that we are in as, as believers as well. As is the case, I think we always end, get to the end of this class and never feel we've had enough time. Um, and you know, we don't, we don't have a lot of time this morning for conversation or questions, um, but we always can um, return to this conversation at some point if there's interest in, in further talking about it. Um, I, I do wanna highlight how valuable some of the comments were, especially around creating vulnerable communities where we have the courage to share with one another. I, the um, Jerry Sitzer said in, in this book, we have to enter the dark space alone, but when we get there, we'll find other people that we can share life with together that um, God did not intend for us to suffer alone. In fact, he intended for us to suffer in community. And it's our own fear that often is the obstacle to building those communities of vulnerability. And I, I have noticed that not everyone will be able to handle those vulnerable conversations, but there are a lot of people who can. So being brave to keep finding the right um, circle of protective factor um, for you, for your family, for the people that you care about is, is a worthwhile task. I just want to um, stop talking and Mark and Ty, any further comments? 
No, I think that was good, Jess. Um, as as Jess said, we we just decided we just decided to do this series, and we didn't know exactly where it would go, but and we had you know sort of some ideas about it, and we are if people are interested in returning to a topic at a later time and unpacking it further, we're, we're more than willing to, to do all that. Um, let me just close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that even though sometimes when we're suffering, we feel very isolated and alone, that you are with us and you are very clear about that, that you are with us in our suffering. We are also grateful that the way you care for us in our suffering is through the, the people around us and through our brothers and sisters in Christ, and and we've we've seen in your scripture today um, just the encouragement and the admonition to to be uh, in good relationship with you and also in good relationship with each other, so that we can be instruments of care for each other when we are individually and collectively struggling. So we thank you that this is the way you've provided for us, and we'd ask that you'll help us to continue to. Uh, find the way to find the, the, the courage, the, the bravery to be vulnerable and to be with each other in the ways that we've described today. And now bless us as we go into our worship time and we ask you to con continue to work in our lives as a church. We ask all this in the name of our son. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, someone in the gym can maybe hit the unrecord. Got it. Unrecord. Unrecord. Stop recording. Awesome. Here we go. Knock it off with the Thanks. <laughs>